Well, welcome back to the Fearless Future podcast. We are your hosts, Glenn Schwarm. And Amber Schwarm. And today we're talking about screw ups. We're talking about making <laughs> mistakes in real estate and the critical mistakes that so many investors make. You know, we have never made any mistakes, I think, in our business. So no, we've done everything perfect. Yeah, never, never a problem. So, perfectly. Oh, man, we have made just a bloody crap load of mistakes over the years, haven't we? Yeah, some really bonehead ones. Yeah, that's for sure. And, I think and, that, and sometimes we've made them more than once, which makes them extra bonehead. Yeah, what's the saying about making mistakes? You make, well, whatever. If you, if you keep making the same mistake over and over again, you're just kind of an idiot, right? You just kind of, you know, you keep making the same one. And we've done that so many times in certain, sometimes you just hope it's going to be better the second time, right? Yeah. You hope maybe the nuances are a little bit, because every, every situation is never exactly the same. A little different. So you sort of think, well, this problem won't be as bad as this problem. And maybe I can, maybe it's like the other problem, but this time I've learned yeah, you wind up screwing. You know up a the lot. the thing I think we've learned the most though through all of our different mistakes through the years is to trust our gut. Because yes. your your gut is rarely wrong. So like if if something's singing out, <laughs> yeah, something's wrong. You need to listen to it. Yeah, we could probably summarize the entire episode with that, right? Yeah, trust, trust your, your gut because it's it's amazing. If you trust your gut with this, it's amazing how 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 successful you can be, even with things that you don't know anything about. Right. A lot of times, your body, your your you, instinct, yeah, your instinct just yeah. kind of knows what it is. So. I thought we'd talk about some things today that I think the most common mistakes that people make, we did early on, and I think we've remedied a lot of these over the years, oh, but, yeah. but one is overpaying. Yeah. And working with a lot of our students, we see a lot of rookie mistakes that people want to make and we're able to yeah. prevent those, yeah. thankfully. But yeah, let's address some of those today because I think it's good for people to know the, the types of things. And what was funny is when we were going over the, the points of this podcast with our marketing director, who is also an investor. He goes, oh, wow, I think I've done every one of those. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, so this should be an interesting episode for those of you who are either in investing or you want to get into investing and avoid, you know, because mistakes are costly. Yeah. And then people don't think about, well, okay, I made a mistake. Well, a mistake in real estate is very expensive because yes. you're, you're losing money with time and you're losing actual money in yep. most cases too. And so I think that people don't realize that how much it can really totally affect your bottom line. And it's frustrating. And how many people have we seen over the years, even students who come in do something don't they don't do it right they don't listen you know they don't they want to do it their own way yeah. they know better than we do and they do their own thing and then get out right and i've met people like that like we have students who have come in done a deal didn't go great for them and they're like you know what i don't want to do it anymore yeah and it's because okay i understand but you've got to learn from those mistakes to move on right you got to decide if you want to you know is the juice worth the squeeze yeah and i think that people and don't always do that for us it definitely is but you have to know what these uh, pitfalls are and avoid them so that you can maximize your profit. Well, you have to do what I've never done. And that's listen to other people's advice. I've never been great about that. Like I've always been, you know, the hard, the hard way. I've always had to kind of figure it out for myself. And, you know, even growing up, I was like that with my mom and dad, just some, I'm doing it myself. Okay, Glenn, go ahead. You know, you say that, but like, we're both Gen Xers. Yep. And, you know, I think the older we get, the more we, you realize how dumb you are. <laughs> That's true. And, and so you're, you're more open to that. So if the younger generation can learn anything from us, it's to, to listen to what other people say, you know, listen to, you have that famous expression is, which is be careful who you take advice from because you might end up just like them. Just make sure that the person you're taking advice from has what you want and yeah. do what they do, do what they did to get there. True. It's, I think that's easier said than done. Wouldn't you say? I, I agree. It's easier said than done because you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And when you're young, you just, you know, kind of want to be independent and flex that muscle. And I'm not sure if that changes when you get older. I think a little bit, you get a little softer on the edges, but let's jump into some things. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about overpaying. I think overpaying is probably the number one mistake that I see. I don't know if it's number one, but I, it's a big one. It's, a, it's definitely a big one. People get really excited about buying a house and. And there lies in the problem. They're excited and they make emotional decisions yeah. instead of business decisions. Let's talk about the very first house we ever bought in 2003. Oh, God. Did we have to? Yeah. I, <laughs> it's painful, but we should really dive into it. So we bought a two-family in 2003. The real estate agent, as a matter of fact, just moved here to Florida by us, actually. Yeah, we um, need to meet up with a friend. Yeah, yeah, Jim. So he, anyway, I w talked to a friend, said I want to get into real estate investing. And so we, you were living in Dallas at the time, and yeah. I was living up here. And we decided to go look at this house. And it had everything wrong with it you can imagine. It, number one, it was cobbed together. The owner had lived there for many years, and God bless him, he had the same name as me, Glenn. I remember that spelled with two N's. 
And he cobbed everything together in yeah. that house. I remember your best friend who was a contractor and investor telling you, I wouldn't touch that with a 10 foot pole. <laughs> and I did not listen because I wanted so bad to get started yeah. in real estate investing. Didn't have a coach, didn't know anything about that. And I remember so bad wanting to buy the house that I ignored all the glaring signs that were in front of me. So we had, that house was on a busy road, mm -hmm. like a very busy road. So it was covered in dirt and dust. It was close to the road. And it had a dirt basement. Had a dirt basement. Everything was cobbed. Everything cobbed together. It was uh, across the street. From the railroad tracks. And the well, dump. No, hold on. Well, hold on. There's lots of stuff here. So across the street from a chemical plant. Yep. Right? Next door to the bad pig. Yes. And the bad pig was a bar. Uh, that a was biker a, bar. A biker <laughs> bar. Like a Hells Angels biker bar that was owned by a cop who'd been fired. Yep. So it's called the bad pig. That was, that was a, a staple in that town for years. It was also, yeah, there was a dump not too far yeah. away, right? Like a block away. The railroad tracks. Railroad tracks were, were right next to the bad pig. And then we found out that horrible yeah. news, right? We yeah. found out about six months after owning it, the neighbors told us that. An 18-year-old kid hung himself in the garage. Yeah. Horrible. So that can't be good karma for that whole thing. So yeah. just a horrible, horrible situation with that house. But and, we and it had tenants in it who... Never paid. Were, uh, yeah, they were underpaying and it was hard to get the payments out of them at all. Yes. So, but we had to have a house. Yeah. So we decided that we we're going to buy that. I decided, I said, just trust me, we're going to buy this house. You're like, really? I'm like, yeah, because I wanted to get into, into the real estate business. Yeah. And, and to me, I thought I could put this deal together with a loan and also creative financing. So I had zero dollars out of my pocket, right? That we had put that together. So we had zero dollars. So that seemed like a good deal. Mm -hmm. So I think sometimes people think the financing makes the deal a great deal when it, maybe it wasn't a great deal. Now, fast forward 21 years later, we still own that property. About 10 years ago, we kind of put $200,000 into it. Renovated it, made it top nice. Top to bottom. Yeah. And now the tenants have destroyed it. It's back to normal. So <laughs> I don't know, but, but now it's, it's probably worth a quarter million dollars. We paid like maybe a hundred for it back then. Yeah. Something like that. But I say all that to say that we overpaid for the house. We ignored everything staring us in the face about it because we made an emotional decision. Yeah, it had all sorts of red flags that we should have listened to, but without being educated in, in real estate investing, we uh, made it. That wasn't just being educated. Think about it. So Kevin, my best friend at the time, who best, my best friend my whole life growing up, he, he, went, he was a contractor and he said, I wouldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole like you I said. Recall. I recall. I know, but I remember, like, I want to repeat that because he said that. And I said, uh-huh. Completely ignored his advice. So I had coaching. But if we had had like our evaluator to uh, a tool. Our Wouldn't have mattered. Of, yes, it would have. No if, way. If we would have known, if we would have known what to look for, we may have been cautious to not make an emotional decision. I we doubt did, it. We didn't run any numbers, honey. We. Uh, no, that's not true. I ran numbers. I, I most certainly ran numbers. I didn't, okay. I, I didn't have our, I know I did. I didn't, I didn't have our home flipping evaluator. I didn't have all the tools we have now. But me, I ran me saying okay right now is the equivalent of you saying yes, dear. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying I didn't just I didn't just say I want to buy the house. I just so I think that emotional decisions make you ignore facts. Would you is that a better way to say it? Um, I think there is some validity to that. But I think if you had the facts going in, like if we had the education we have now and the experience that we have now, we wouldn't well, have made that kind of decision. Well, if we had the experience, so so experience and facts are different things. Yes. Because experience. I, I agree with that. Ex wow. You agree right here publicly on this episode. You agree with me. I mean, can we make sure that we make a, make a note about that. We can save this episode. So <laughs> let's put a heart on that, this particular spot. So I think that, yeah, experience, experience tells us not to do things because we've been burned before where we can ignore facts. If we're making emotional decisions and we say, I got to get into real estate, which, which isn't that what most people when I bet you people listening right now are thinking, I just want to get into real estate. So I think this is part of a much bigger conversation, which maybe we can well, have on a different podcast. We've but, got time. Let's talk. Well, I think that also depends on the person. Whereas you're very much a type A risk taker type of person who who makes emotional decisions by nature. You think? And I, I tend to be, I'm also in that type A risk taker category, but not to the extreme that you are. I tend to have a little more logic that goes into my, and, and facts that goes into my decision making. So I, I think, I think that's a factor as well. Yeah. So you say you're better than me. Yeah. That's what you're trying to say. Okay. No, I Got didn't it. say that at all. You know, that, <laughs> they both have their pros and cons. Yeah. You know, so because without your uh, 
risk taking risk taking ability and and to the extreme that it is we wouldn't be where we are today because i would have been more conservative yeah well i think that it's important to talk about you know i had said making notes for the for this episode i said you can't manage away a bad buy right so you can't buy a house wrong pay too much for it and then so if you're going to buy a flip and you pay too much for it i don't care how great your management skills are you can't manage that away, right? I agree with that completely, um, but you might be able to change your exit strategy and still make the deal work. Well, that's fair. You know, we had the house in Saratoga. So, 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 so let's talk about an yeah. example. Let's give an example on that. The house that we bought in Saratoga. <laughs> okay. The asbestos house? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, apparently, it had asbestos in the sheetrock, which we never even knew that was really a thing. All right. right, let's. We got we got to back up, though, because I think people want to know, like, how did you learn that or why did you tell yourself that you had that? Well, we didn't. Yeah. Our, we took down a wall, and it, was, it had a lot of problems in the house. They took down a wall, and they put it in the dumpster, and the neighbor called bitching about something because he was just a horrible neighbor. Yes, he was. Oh, and God. what Bugged he, us the whole time. Yeah, he's a male version of a Karen. What do they call them? Ken. Ken? <laughs> Ken, maybe a Ken. I don't know. So he was just a male version. He just wouldn't stop complaining about every little thing. So he called the town and said, they take a while out. There's a dumpster in the driveway. And I don't know if he turned. Anyways, they came over and tested the sheetrock yep. and said there was... Asbestos, asbestos in, in the sheetrock. So that that turned into a thirty thousand dollar mistake. Yep. That's a whole different episode we can talk about at a different time. Yeah. How to just. But we were planning on flipping that house. But we by put the neighbor in the dumpster, not the sheetrock. <laughs> anyway. And then he ended up moving right after. Yes, I think we finished. Yes, yeah. After yeah. Uh, but but we had to change our exit strategy because we were planning on flipping that house. But because of how much money we had to put into it with the unexpected renovations, because we had to strip the entire house out of the sheetrock. Yeah. Out of the entire house. It was around 50, but that was all said and done, 50, 60 grand extra minimum yeah. to do that. So go ahead. So so because of that, we said, well, we can't flip it and make a profit. Let's hold on to it. Let's let the house appreciate. We turned it into a short-term rental. Right. It's right next to Saratoga racehorse track. So, so you know, during the summer months, we get $15,000 for a six-week time frame. So, it, you know, it ended up working out, but we had to change our, our plan. We had to change our exit strategy. And depending on where you are in your business, that may or may not work for you. You know, That's you true. may have needed that cash yeah. as profit. So it's so important to do your due diligence and to to evaluate the house properly and to not overpay. I mean, during our workshops, you are the master of saying you make your money when you buy. Right. You realize it when you sell, but yeah. you make your money when you buy. So the lower you can buy the house, the better. So I think one of the things too is you you know you can't always change your exit strategy. In that particular house, we could, and I think the listeners need to know that we actually did a, what's called a cash out refinance to pull the money back out of that. But we had a private lender on it. We had to keep the private lender on for a little while. It got very complicated. Yeah. It was muddy, but we got it done. But it took years to get through all that process. But we were able to navigate through it. We'll make money when we sell the house, right. which we might, we're talking about doing now. Because it's appreciated over the years. Correct. But yeah. So we wouldn't have made money had we flipped it and so sold I, it then. I think it's important people know that if you're going to, you know, it's almost like, I don't know what the saying is, but when you're at the gym, you can't, you can't, use a treadmill and outrun ice cream sundaes every day you can't outrun cheeseburgers every day you can't outrun bad a bad diet as right. much as you think you can especially when you get older like i'm 55 and i know that if i eat bad for multiple days in a row good luck yeah. i could do cardio all day long and i can't outrun it because the damage has been done yeah so if you buy a house wrong really wrong you can relook at another exit strategy but the truth of the matter is that you may not be able to manage yourself out of that project and you, if you do manage, it won't be a profit. Right. You're, you're just managing to not lose at that point. Right. right. Isn't that true? Yeah. So I think you're managing to not lose. And I think that one of the reasons people overpay all the time is because they don't, they don't use a formula, number one. Mm -hmm. They use the MLS to buy properties, which is always full retail on, on the MLS. They're not looking for off-market properties, which we have other episodes all about how to find off-market properties. So make sure you stay tuned and subscribe for all that so you can learn all those upcoming episodes. The, the other thing I think that um, causes people to overbuy is are things like using the MLS, using auctions. Auctions are kind of case in point for people making emotional decisions because you get That's caught, you get really caught up in the intensity of I want to win. I want to win the bid. And so people tend to overpay during auctions, but also the MLS, because it, once it hits the MLS, everybody else knows about it. So you have a lot of competition and that usually drives the price up if it's if it's yes. a good deal. I was talking to a, a woman that wants to be mentored by us a couple of weeks ago, and I was really surprised to hear this, especially in this day and age of 
of how much information is at people's fingertips. But I, I had, she had bought a rental property, which I was like, oh, good. You're already an investor then. You bought a rental property. And I asked her to start sharing some numbers with me. And she's like, well, you know, I got it off of the MLS, but I talked them down $15,000. So I just, I, I got a good deal on it. <laughs> and I said, uh, okay, how did, yeah, how did that look with the comps? You know, did you compare? What are comps? Didn't um, even know. She didn't even know what comps were. Yeah. And so, yes, she negotiated $15,000 off the asking price, but they could have just had it marked up $15,000. Sure. So it wasn't necessarily a good deal. Yeah. So I think, I think that's a really, thing to be really cautious of just because you feel like you got a sale on it yeah. or you negotiated well, still doesn't mean it's a good deal. We have been offered in upstate New York by the city of Schenectady to buy houses for a dollar. Yeah, years ago. I remember years that conversation. Ago, and, yeah. and we still couldn't make the numbers work because of their code enforcement. You had to bring everything up to code. But because yeah. of that, we couldn't even make the numbers work on a house for a dollar. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, right. So, so it so, doesn't mean it's a good deal just because it's cheap. That's right. I want to go back and talk about the auction thing because something really occurred to me. I had forgotten about the auctions that we did for many years ago. We had a, a woman that worked for us used to run the auctions for us. And she would bid at the auctions. And I can remember being in the house at night and, and watching the computer and how the auctions used to work online. They probably still do. People are putting their bids in. You have to register first off. At certain sites, you have to put a deposit down, but we, um, just to put a bid in. But you are putting your offer in. And then everybody waits for the, tech, the countdown clock, yeah. has, has five seconds left. Then they submit their bid, thinking that that's going to get it. But what that does is that extends the auction time, 15 more minutes. And what I found was that we would get emotional in that. Yes. Like, hey, hey, it's exciting. Somebody just came back and offered 150. What do you want to do? Can we go to 152? And I'm thinking my number was 150. Then you start, you start to justify in your head. Yeah. You start to say, wait a minute. Um, okay, 152. Um, okay, so $2,000. Okay, I can absorb $2,000. So I just won't make as much on that deal. Or maybe I'll, I'll put different tile in. Or maybe I'll, yeah, I'll do something different there. Okay, yeah, go for 152. And next thing you know, you're at 156. Then you're at 159. And before you know it, you start justifying in your head because you're making emotional decisions. Yeah. And I remember one time that we got all done with a bid and finally it got too high for me. And I forgot what the number was. It was like 175, 175,000 or something. And I was like, was this the big house in the, that had the basement that was full of water? Is it that one? I don't, I don't, I don't area, I think. um, no, I don't think so, but it might've been, I don't know for sure. I know what you're talking about. We should. We should do an episode on that. Yeah. Yeah. That had uh, yeah eight foot of water frozen in the basement. That yeah. was an interesting conversation. That's for a different episode. So make sure you subscribe to learn about all these crazy things we've been through. But on that house, at the auction process, I remember distinctly saying, I'm out. I can't do anymore. I, I reached my limit. I was already 10,000 or 15,000 over where I right. wanted to spend because emotions drove me there because I hate to lose. Well, and it's excitement too. I mean, like when eBay, you know, maybe, maybe a lot of the listeners have never bought a house at auction, but a lot of us have bought stuff on eBay when it was really popular. Yeah. And you, you wait for that countdown clock yeah. and you're like, click, click, click. Did I win it? Yeah. You know, there's like that excitement. So I remember getting all done and I said, we're out. We're not going to do it. <laughs> we're, I want to check out of this, this auction. So we did. Literally. Three, three minutes later, we got an email saying, congratulations, you won the bid. And I'm like, wait a minute, I thought we lost the bid. And what I found out was the bank was bidding against us. To drive the price up. Yes, they were, they were counting on our emotions to get more out of the house. So I had to learn early on that it's not always another person that's bidding mm -hmm. against you. It's the bank trying to drive up, if it was the bank auction. They were trying to drive that price up. And I think they even have people at the live auctions that do that too. They like do. they have plants in the audience that do that. They do. Yeah. They say like right. they'll, they'll put the price on really, really cheap to draw people in, but then they have somebody there to escalate it. Do you remember? I think you, were you with me when I went to the auction in Schenectady one time at the courthouse steps? I wasn't, but I remember that story. I stood in the steps and the guy who was bidding for the bank, looked like a homeless person. Yeah. I looked at him and he started bidding. And I'm thinking all of us looked at each other like, does that guy have any money? He's bidding with us. What are you talking about? And then come to find out he had the most money. He was the bank, but that's what he did. His job was yep. to bid it up. And then finally he said, and people got to know who he was. He was the bank. So anyway, we spent a long time talking about overpaying and emotions. I think emotions are probably the most, the key thing that makes people screw up more often yeah. than not in, in real estate investing. So the next thing I want to talk about, I think is undercapitalization. Yeah. That just means you don't have any cash for an emergency. Yep. That's the biggest problem, the biggest mistake people have that they get into real estate investing 
maybe they've maxed everything out and now they're getting ready to go and do their deal and they can get 100% financing from somebody for like a, a lender or a private lender for their deal. But then there's things that happen. Mm -hmm. There's all of a sudden a, an extra problem, a different contractor, uh, whatever. They open up share. a wall, there's a can of worms, whatever, like, like anything could happen. So it's always good to have that little oops factor, you know, rainy day fund in your account. You know, people, people, we've, we've come across, across houses before that were mid flip and people ran out of money. Yes. You know, number one is probably because they didn't buy it right. Number two is they didn't count their cost or they were just really poor managers, which we're going to jump into that in just a minute here. But you want to have that little rainy day fund just in case you need it for an emergency that might come up during a flip. Yeah, I think it's important just to know that, you know, even like a lot of people that we work with will help them get 100 percent financing on their deals or maybe 90 percent of the purchase price and 100 percent of the renovation costs, which is great. But that renovation comes in draws. Mm -hmm. So you have to complete a certain amount of work. Then they send you a check. Now you can get the check within 48 hours, but now you got to pay the contractor. Right. So in the middle of all that, you may have to pay a contractor because they may have to pay their bills. And mm -hmm. we, you know, that's a whole different conversation. We hate, <laughs> we hate that, but it's, but it's a fact of life. Yeah. And so they may need money or you may have to buy certain materials because you see a hot sale on a vanity you want to get for that house. And it's going to cost a thousand bucks. It's going to save you a thousand, but you're going to, you know, you need a couple of the thousand bucks in cash to right. buy it, whatever the item might be roofing or whatever it might be. And if you don't have a little extra capital to help you through that, it's difficult. Right. Now, it doesn't mean you have to have cash, right? It means you, you can have credit. You have to have access to yeah, money. So access. if you have a home equity, like be thinking about this in advance when you're doing a deal, have some home equity, have some equity lines on a, on a rental property if you can, if you can find a lender to do that for you. Even have a private lender ready to lend you money on the site. Even a private lender that can loan you 10, 20 grand. Mm -hmm. So listen, if I need to borrow 20 grand, do you have that available? I'll pay you a 10% fee or pay right. you 2000 bucks to have that available to me. Or, you know, make a deal with somebody. But if you do things like that, now you're prepared because there's nothing worse than having a little catastrophe or a big catastrophe happen and you have no money to deal with it. Right. Because money fixes a lot of problems. It does. But you have to have the money to fix it. So I know early on that we didn't have a lot of money. It makes it- uh, There makes were some it, challenges there. There were. So get, get, not just have capital, have access to capital. Right. And so, you know, a lot of people, we help them get 0% um, credit cards. That's mm -hmm. a good way to get, to get that. So a lot of ways to get it done, but you just got to be smart about it. Yep. Right. And be, be thinking in advance, like don't just buy the house and then, then go look for the credit while you're getting ready to close the house. Yeah. You, have to do you that. know, the thing I do love about real estate is it's, it's a very mathematical decision, whether you buy a house or not, you don't, there really doesn't need to be any emotion in it whatsoever. But I think, well, that's, that sounds wonderful, but it's very, I think tell, it's, tell it listener okay. right now. Don't, don't get excited about your first flip. Well, I didn't say excited. <laughs> well, that's an emotion. Excitement, you still can taper that and still make a logical decision based on the facts. And yeah. you have comps, you have numbers to run, you, you have spreadsheets to figure out your, your cost of the renovation, whether that's materials or labor or whatever. And yeah. I think a lot of people just do get caught up because they've watched HGTV and they're like, oh, I can do this. You know, yeah. that seems like a good deal. And then they start. And they've never calculated the cost. Yeah. And those are the people that tend to run out of money. That's all that boring stuff. Those details I, I hear people talk about. I'm all heart, baby. <laughs> no, <laughs> well, it's a I, good thing you have me then. I, it is. It is. So I think maybe kind of a, a good rule of thumb is try to keep at least 5% of your total project in available funds for you at a minimum, right? Yeah. Do you think that's a fair, fair I, number? I think that's fair. So if, it, you, if you have a $200,000 project, try and keep at least 10 grand available to you any given time. Right. Honestly, 10% is going to be better. Obviously, uh, any larger amount is going to yeah, be better. Maybe the house takes longer to sell than you think, and there's extra holding costs. Right. You know, there, there's all, a number of things that could happen. So it's, yeah. it's always good to have that little cushion for sure. So doing a renovation or even a rental, the next thing that I think people make huge mistakes on is over improving. <laughs> and this is a lot of your department because as you may not know in our world, so Amber Amber handled all of the renovations, managing contractors, hiring, firing, scopes of work, uh, all those details that I don't like. And I handle the buying and selling on the business side of things. So I think you could talk a lot about what what is over improvement. Let's talk about that so people can learn about what over improvement is because people do it all the time. Once people have acquired a house, this is probably the number one thing I see happen with uh, rookies, especially because People tend to want to design with their own taste in mind. And of course, your taste is going to impact it no matter what. 
but you want to be really cautious to stay within uh, the parameters of, you know, what the comps are and what the budget is and, and whether it, and that's something that I feel like I've always had a really good knack at was not over improving the house. I'm not going to say we've never done it. Um, Cause I think a couple of times we have, as, I, I know we have as, as a designer, <laughs> like I want to make every room Pinterest worthy, yeah. but, but you again have to have your business hat on. So you need to make very calculated choices here. Do you remember, so, the, remember the third yeah, house we ever did? We, we made the bathroom upstairs. We turned a, a closet or a it big, was, it was a small a, bedroom it was or like something. A, like a utility closet. It was a kind, kind of, of a weird room. So we yeah. turned it into a, a nice big bathroom with a jacuzzi tub and I did the walls dark and it was very spa like we actually had buyers that came through there that said, I think this is too nice for us. Yes. Which, yeah. which blew my mind. It was a $160,000 house probably They couldn't back even then. justify spending that much money, even yeah. though it probably was still in the price range because it looked too nice. Yeah. That one always got me, but. Yeah. So we, we probably but spent it, five grand extra on that bathroom. We didn't have to spend. Right. We, people I said, well, you sold something it. Really yes, but we could have yeah. put, more, they could put that money in our pocket. Right. And that, that's the difference is, yeah, your end product might look really, really good, but could you have been more profitable? And this is a business. We're in this for profit. So I, I see people, you know, spending, spending way too much money on kitchens, especially. Um, I want to ask you why, because let's talk about why. So they think that they have to go, you know, spend this $40,000 on new cabinets when you can probably put just like the box cabinets in or, or a builder grade cabinet in, or they might think, well, I wouldn't want a house with laminate countertops. I would want I would want a solid surface countertop. So they put granite or quartz in. So they're those are two about or their, three times the cost. So it's their personal. It's, it's their, their personal taste. Personal taste. They're putting their personal taste in. Would you say that's emotion? That's very much emotion. So I'm just I'm thinking about this episode. It's a, it's a lot based it's on emotion. It's a lot based on emotions. So absolutely. So you could just say that emotions are going to cost you a lot of money in this yeah. game, right? So if you use your emotions at any level, it's going to cost you. So continue on. I'm just thinking about that. And and sometimes there's a fine line there. You know, you do want to make the house really nice. You want to turn over a quality renovation. You don't want to sell people, you know, a piece of junk that you've just kind of slapped together. So I'm, I'm not saying skimp on the important things, but you don't need to overspend. You know, there's people that, you know, go all out on landscaping to make the curb appeal in front of the house look really nice. And there might, so there's always exceptions to the rule too. You know, if you're in a high-end house, by all means, spend the $40,000 on the kitchen cabinets. But if you're just in, you know, middle America, $200,000 houses, $300,000 houses, you can get away with a lot of builder grade materials and, and that's going to be very acceptable in those yeah. price ranges. So um, just kind of put that little caveat on there. But, you know, I see people go crazy with landscaping and that that ends up costing a lot of money and you have to keep up with it. So by the time you sell it, it doesn't even really look good. Um, and again, not using comps. That's a huge mistake because again, you have something tangible to make your decision off of when you're deciding does the house need new windows? Does it need a new roof? Does the driveway need to be replaced? But what do you what say? So, like? so what do you mean when you say comps? When you say comps for when it when it comes to over improvement, what do, I mean comps tell you what a house will sell for, but what else can you use a comp for? Because as you're, I know the answer, but yeah. I want you to say tell people what you're getting at. So whenever you you're pulling those comps, you want to make sure that it's a, a repair, you know, a renovated house. So what does that renovated house have? Does it have solid surface countertops? Does it have tile or does it have linoleum or you know, is there hardwood? Like you, you have something to look at and compare to, to help you make your decisions. Is the basement finished? Is it not finished? Like there, there's all these different factors to know in this price range, what kind of features should I put in this house? Are you saying that when you're looking at comps now, so now you're not just looking at the numbers, you're looking saying, Pictures. okay, how do I look at what, what are the other houses selling? What do they have? Yes. Do they have granite? Do they have laminate? Do they have a pool? Do they have, or whatever right. it might be. Do they You're have a finished basement? comparing the houses to yeah. see, you know, can I sell my house at around the same price as this based on the, the features that I'm going to put in it? So use the comps to not over improve right. is what you're saying. Right. So, yeah. And that depends on the area of the country that you're in too. You know, I know coming from Texas, when I moved to New York, the things you got in houses were very different in Texas than they were in New York. You know, and right. it just, you, you got a lot more for your money in Texas. Yeah. So if you're in a different area, it's really important to look at those comps and see, you know, I think we're fortunate. We get to see a lot of pictures now. Yeah. It used to be back in the day, you didn't get all those pictures a lot of times. Right. And now you have tons of pictures people put on Zillow and all over online. So yeah, you have no excuses for making bad decisions, really. Well, that's true. People will still make them. But let's talk about managing the project. Let's 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 do that. Then I want to talk about holding costs at the end, because I think this leads right into managing the project. Yeah. Because we talked about how you can't manage your way out of a bad buy. But you can also 
manage your way into losing a lot of money. Yeah. If you don't do it, if you don't do it right, and you can manage your way to make a lot more profit if you do it right. And that was always your area of expertise. There's just some steps that that we do and and that we teach that you know, I think are important. Yeah, and this one is right up there with another one of the rookie mistakes I see a lot of newbies make, and it's just kind of taking for granted that you 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 need to manage that job like a boss. Like you need to be organized and structured and have plans. And one, one thing that I was always really big on, and they're a pain of the butt to develop. They take a few hours up front, but is a really detailed and comprehensive scope of work. And that outlines what the contractor needs to know in every single room, what you want to happen, what SKUs you want, what items you want, and what, you know, paint colors and floor, co- like, like it just details everything that you want done with that house. But then the other thing that that does. Let me ask you a question in there. How long does it take you, when, when you were doing that for us, how long does it take you to put together a, a detailed scope of work? How long would it, because I remember you sitting down and doing that. How long do you yeah, think it took prob- you to do that? Probably three or four hours, because I was a little anal about it too. Like I wanted to make sure that I didn't miss anything. Because like one of my pet peeves was, you know, coming back to me after we agree on a price and saying, well, you forgot to include this. So I was always probably a little too um, detailed in some things that maybe aren't necessary, especially once you have a good working relationship with a contractor. So, you know, a good three or four hours, but that saved me right? hours and hours and hours, probably days had I not had it. That saved me so much time because it kept the job structured. And the other thing about the scope of work that's really important, well, number one, when you go in to a meeting with a new contractor with a, a detailed scope of work, they know you mean business too. You know, right. you're not just going in there saying, well, I'm thinking about doing this or what do you think about that? Like you you come in as the authority. This is what I want done and here's what I'm willing to pay for it. And the other thing that I really loved about the scope of work is we structured it uh, to follow a payment plan too because contractors are notorious for saying, oh, I'm 30% done with the job or I'm 50% done with the job. But if you don't have anything to measure that with, that can get really out of hand really quick and people can lose a lot of money because what happens is yeah. contractors want to pay their guys on Friday but if the amount of work isn't done for, for that phase, then you get upside down on your payments. And then by the end of the job, you're out of money and there's still, you know, 50 or 30 percent of the job left to do. That's that's so, probably a big rookie mistake that a lot of people, e- rookie and experienced people, because even even we did early in the day, you know, even a few years in, we would overpay. And I think that people don't realize, but when you lose money on a contractor or you get to fire that contractor because they don't show up again, yep. now you've lost money. So it's all part, th- that whole managing, there's a lot to it. Yeah, It's a scope of work. It's managing, it's managing the payments, right? It's managing all of that. Because if you don't do that together, if you don't work those all well together, forget it, you're you're done. And, and we still do this to this day. So <laughs> it was yesterday. So we're, I, I'm actually redoing one of the staircases in our, our mudroom from our garage. I noticed that when and, I came back and saw a contractor in our house this week. And uh, he, he was there yesterday doing demo. So his, his scope of work for this staircase was just demo and a little bit of finish work. And so he texted me yesterday and said, hey, can we settle up? And so I texted him back and I'm like, well, we're not exactly done with this phase of the, the scope of work. So I'll, I said, I'm comfortable paying you half and then I'll pay you the other half when it's done. You know, it's a new relationship I have with this guy. It's the first job he's done for us. So you know, even, even on a $725 scope of work, I still didn't pay him the whole thing because he wasn't done. Yeah. And, and I hope people really, really take this seriously because this is how a lot of people end up losing money and getting screwed. So when you have those phases though, that are attached to payments and you can put, you can even put like benchmark dates on them. It keeps your job running smoothly. What about when they have a sob story, Amber? Yeah. I don't care. I've heard (laughs) them all and you used to be a sucker for them. And I'm terrible at it. Yeah, I was a horrible manager. I was manager. like, well, whatever. You still got to get the work done. Yeah. And that's the conversation I have with all the contractors up front is I love paying my contractors. You will never have to chase me to get your check. What I want from you in return, though, is completed work. Because if you complete this phase, I will write you a check. Do you remember we finished our office in New York? We had this loud mouth, loud mouth guy that ran the job site up there. Just a hardcore big guy yelled, raised his voice yeah. all the time. Just. He was, you know, jerk. yeah, he was a 40 year old guy with a seven year old mentality, right? Just terrible. And so it was a, on a, on a Thursday, he came and said, I got to get $7,000 payment. I said, you're not done yet. And he said, he said, I just got punch out stuff. I said, I know you have a few thousand dollars. And the punch, punch out, out takes yes. <laughs> forever. He goes, well, we done in a couple hours ago. Well, then, then get yeah. this day yeah. then get it done. Yeah. And he pushed and pushed and pushed. And I, he wore me down that day. You were not there. I said, 
I'm going to give you this money. Don't you dare F me. I said, don't you dare. I said, I, I have not done this for years, and I'm going to do this. Now, you get a man of your word, right? Oh, I'm a man of my word. So I said, I said, don't, don't you dare screw me on this. And he said, he said, no, I won't, I won't. And then the next day, he didn't show up. And I said, where are you? And he said, I'm going to come back to your job. He said, I heard you told one of my guys that you're worried I wasn't going to show up. I said, I did. He goes, and just for that, I'm not going to show up. Really, that's why you're not going to show yeah. up? Or because you're an a-hole yeah. and you stole my money, you're not going to show up? His word was as good as Oak as the guy in uh, Jerry Maguire. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He was, he was full of crap. So no matter how great the story, we've all gotten screwed with that. But that's yeah. how you lose money in yeah. flips. So we lost. We had to have somebody else come in and it cost a few thousand dollars extra to yeah. finish it and the headache yeah. and the hassle and all that. So I think it's important. And there's also, it's not just managing. This is not just for managing a renovation project, right? This is for managing an entire project. Now. Let me define a project. If you're wholesaling a house, you have to find the house. You have to get title clear on the house. You have to sell the house and deal with a real estate agent, deal with a lawyer, possibly if you're in a lawyer state, deal with the title company, deal with the buyers, deal with the, the tenants won't move out. There's a whole process you have to manage this whole thing. And the better you manage that process and the cooler you stay through it, the more money you'll make yep. because you go faster. And that leads me to my last point, which is holding costs. Yeah. So everything that you're managing, people say, well, you know, it makes sense. You know, time is money. Well, time, time is 100% money when it comes to real estate investing. And just at a very high level, when you own a house, it costs money every single day. We have a whole episode coming up that is dedicated to- On your burn costs, your daily, your, weekly, and monthly burn yes, costs. Yes, what the silent killers of real estate yep. deals. And it's a whole deal, of, it's, it's a whole episode about what can kill your real estate deal. So, so make sure you subscribe so you can actually learn or learn those from that. It's a really powerful session and that's coming up very soon. So at a high level, when you have a house, you know, you're paying interest to the lender, you're paying taxes, you're paying insurance, you're paying maintenance, you're keeping up with the house, all those things. And they all cost money. The average cost to own a home, let's say is between a hundred and two hundred dollars a day per day, a day. So, so when you start thinking of your project in terms of how many days is this going to cost me, it's a lot. And I don't think people ever think about that. Honestly, it wasn't until we developed the spreadsheet that we use that showed us our daily, weekly, and monthly burn right. that it, we were like, that was like an aha moment. It yeah. was like, that's like throwing, you know, a hundred to two hundred dollars a day just out of your pocket onto the ground, hundred yeah. hundred dollar bills just on the ground. Like I, when you think of it that way. You're like, I want to get in and out of this as quick as possible. Yeah, if you treat it that way, you'll you'll make a lot more money. So again, there's a whole episode dedicated to that coming up that's uh, you're going to want to... Yeah, you, make sure you subscribe if you're not subscribed because yeah, you're going to want to hear that. You're going to want to see that. So let's just kind of recap really quick because we talked about a lot of things here. Um, I know that the main thing I want to talk about is that you said that I was right about something. Did I say you were right? Yeah. I don't remember that. Just like the contractor, how quickly we forget, right? So... <laughs> So we talked about, you know, the, the critical mistakes that property investors make and, and, uh, and we all do it. So yeah. I think that's part of the, it's part of the game. It, it, there's still going to be a learning curve, you know, no matter what, there's still a yeah. learning curve, but the more systematic that you can make your decisions and run your business, you know, don't, don't run it by the, what's that saying? The, the seat of your pants. Seat of your pants. Yes. yes. Don't run it by the seat of your pants. Like be strategic about it and you'll yeah. make the most money. So we talked about overpaying. Don't we talked a lot about emotions today too? Yep. Don't use your emotions to to overpay for the house. Don't use don't use your emotions to uh, over improve the house. That was yep. another big one we talked about. We talked about not being undercapitalized because when you don't have enough money, it will actually cost you more yeah, money. Don't run out of money. <laughs> don't run out of money. So make sure you have available funds to you. We talked about managing the entire project, including scopes of work, contractors, um, and the buying process, the selling process, and all that. And then finally, we talked about holding costs at a high level to manage that because every project costs a lot every day. So I hope this episode was very helpful to people and uh, hopefully they can uh, learn a lot from it. So that concludes this episode of the Fearless Future podcast. If you liked what you heard, make sure that you click that like button and also subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a beat.